Right. Well, welcome back everybody for day four of our workshop. Uh, I wanted to again begin by introducing our facilitators today. Uh, Peg Steffen is still here at the helm uh, being our facilitator. We have Missy Holzer again that you met Missy yesterday, Kristen Metzger, and Elaine is, if she has not left us, she is about to leave us, I believe, right Elaine? Right, until this afternoon and then I'll be with you all day tomorrow. Okay, oh. great. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, I'd, Have a I'd great like day. To... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Elaine. I'm going. See you guys later. Got to get to the next meeting. Okay. Um, I wanted to start uh, as we have been doing with some questions from yesterday that came up. And uh, first of all, you know, one of the things that you might have seen on the welcome slide is it's Vera Rubin's birthday today. So if you have a Twitter account, uh, you might check out uh, what's happening on Twitter with that. And we had that posted on the uh, welcome slide and we could probably put that in chat as well. So the first question that we're getting is, uh, to get the certificate, do you have to have all the homework done correct? I don't, I don't know if that means, is it correct you have to have the homework done? We certainly aren't grading the homework. Uh, but yes, you have to, in order to get a certificate of completion, you have to complete all the required evaluation forms for each day. You can get that certificate whether you are watching the recording, recorded sessions or whether you are participating live. It doesn't matter because we do understand people have conflicts. We would like everybody to have all of the evaluation forms completed by Sunday night, because Monday is when I'm going to go in and start pulling the people who have completed their course requirements. Uh, because we know that a lot of you are starting school soon. You need those certificates of completion for your administration. And we want to get those out to you early next week. I'll remind you about this again tomorrow on our last day together, but uh, Several of you have been emailing every day and saying, is it okay if I didn't finish the homework from last night? And the answer is yes, as long as you get it done by the end of the weekend. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, so the next question we have is, will you be developing any training for educators on how to directly access the LSST or VRO data? Uh, we, we, don't have a way to do that now because we don't even have a portal and we don't have data. But in the next few years, we'll certainly be taking a look at that. And as I mentioned, we do have an idea on the table about uh, creating some kind of free form exploration place where you will have some access to data and tools. If you want data beyond the EPO data set, as I described yesterday, you'll need to actually create the equivalent of a science account and go in through our data management system. Um, but right now we don't have any details on that because you know we don't have a telescope up and running yet. So stay in touch, that's the best I can tell you. Uh, yesterday at the end of our session, we had a discussion with some people who stayed online about closed captioning. And uh, Elaine did some research for us and one of the questions was, can we have closed captioning during these sessions? Because sometimes it's hard to understand a word or, that a speaker might be saying or uh, somebody like me talking to you right now. Uh, it turns out that you can uh, get closed captioning if you use Google Slides. Uh, there is a control for that that you can turn on. And what I will do is I will post this information in the chat once I'm done speaking. Um, and I don't know if you all have noticed, but the chat for each day is saved and posted on the meeting page in addition to the videos. So if you've been interested in any of these links that have been whizzing by as many people are contributing in the chat, 
you can go back and you can find those links or you can find the comments uh, that people made. We don't save the chat for individual breakout rooms, but we do have the chat saved for the main session and you can access that uh, right underneath the videos each day if you'd like to see that. Uh, it turns out that Zoom also has a closed captioning feature, but you either have to attach a third party app or somebody has to be transcribing what you're saying as you say it. So we don't have that enabled now, but it turns out there is a way to do that. Another question that came up yesterday is somebody asked about use rights for our videos or images. And everything is totally available for you to use. What I'd like to do is uh, share my screen for a moment. And I just wanted to take you quickly to um, the Rubin Observatory Gallery, which is right here. And again, we can put in links for this as well. This is the webcam that Kristen was telling you about yesterday. But uh, on the gallery, you're able to access uh, a number of pictures uh, by category, and those are there right now. So you can see you know, engineering pictures, you can see pictures of the telescope being built, uh, videos that have been made, and renderings. And then finally, you asked about the, the media use policy. And if you go down on this page, uh, the media use policy is right here. So as long as you give us credit uh, for using anything on this web page, or for instance, that video that we showed you of the Hoberman sphere, you're perfectly free to use it uh, as you wish. I also wanted to mention yesterday uh, that 168 of you took the pretest post test. Well, kind of divide that roughly by half because most of us took it twice. But if you if you hadn't noticed what you can do when you go in there is you can take a look at how people actually answered the questions, the frequently missed questions, uh, where people thought the correct answers were on each one. And uh, you can access that uh, also through your own, uh, let's see, I think I have this. Yeah. So if you were taking the test, uh, you'll see these as pie charts. So you can see what people thought the correct answer was. And we did have a question at the very end of yesterday's session about what, where's the answer key? And you know, we had purposely not given you the answer key while you were taking the test, but the answer key is posted now on that meeting page from yesterday, if you'd like to go back and look at it. Okay, a uh, couple more questions that I wanted to cover that came up yesterday. Uh, one of the questions had to do with, in the teacher guide, we have a section that's called common student ideas. And the question is, why do you call it common student ideas? Isn't it really misconceptions? Uh, well, some of them are misconceptions, but not all of them. Uh, very often students have sort of a mix of the right idea and the wrong idea. So it's not totally wrong. It's just maybe partially wrong, partially formed. And then other times students come in to a lesson that you present um, not being confused, but get confused as a result of what they're looking at or listening to. Uh, we call those learning confusions. So we didn't want to just kind of lump them all together and say, these are misconceptions students have because we think there's actually a variety of different conceptual issues that are going on there. And so we lumped them together just under that one title. Uh, let's see, I think that's all I have for questions right now. And I wonder if anybody, we have just a few minutes if you want 
Does anybody have any other questions that have come up that you'd like to talk about right now? Yeah, Artis, I have a few from the chat box. Okay, great. Uh, so a couple of them are logistical for the program and for credit. Uh, so first, is there any way they, the student, that the participants can tell if they've done everything that they need to do or if they're missing something? Um, good question. You, you can, well, first of all, we've made all the forms um, editable in the sense that you can go back and submit another response. So if you're not sure, you can do it again. But I don't think there's an easy way for you to tell right now unless um, you don't get any reply from me next week to say that you finished anything, everything. And um, I haven't thought through exactly how we're going to communicate with you that way. I think the easy, straightforward thing is for those of you who asked for a certificate and fulfilled the requirements, we'll send those out. And then go back for those of you who asked for one and didn't fulfill the requirements, uh, perhaps I at that point can say, you know, we didn't get everything from you, here's what we're missing. Okay, I believe that would end up answering Dean's question, which was, will you let us know if something is missing? Sure. Okay, uh, there's a, related to this, there's a, they're flying in right now. Um, so we have another one. Are we looking for certificates in the email or snail mail? We will be sending them to you attached to, the e to an email. That way you can get them very quickly. We, as you might imagine, are also working from home. So we don't have an easy way to snail mail certificates or print them. Okay. They're very nice though. I think you'll like them when you see them. They're jazzy. Okay. Um, and then how do we ask for a certificate for a certificate or is that something an automatic? Yeah, uh, we asked if you wanted one on the entry form for the registration. I think we may have also asked you on the teach instructor information form on the first day. If you've changed your mind and you want one now, or you're not sure if you asked for it, just put that in um, one of your forms, okay? Like the optional form that you can put in every day, because I am reading through everything that you're putting in there. And I can snag that out and make sure that we, we get you on the right list. Four more questions. Um, there was a repeat question from yesterday. I think you've already nailed this for today. Uh, where were the answers to the pre-post test? I think you've already okay. said. Right. So if you go to the meeting page from yesterday, uh, yesterday's meeting page, when you went to it yesterday, had a link that said, uh, uh, I'm looking at it now, pre-test, post-test, click this link to begin the test. If you look right underneath it now, it says pre-test, post-test with answer key. Okay. Perfect. Um, there's a question from Becky. She's, she's a little confused. Um, if our group finished the web assignment in the group, do they have to redo it by themselves for credit? I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit, Missy. I, oh. I heard the first part. If you finished it in the group. Yeah, do they have to redo it by themselves for credit? Um, what is it? Is it? Uh, that's, uh, the, that's the web assignment. The web assignment. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Um, so Artist, you, I, think it, I think it means going through the actual app and answering the questions sort of as a student. Oh, okay. So thank you, Kristen. Uh, well, all we're looking at for credit is are you filling out the evaluation forms every day? So one of those, of course, is you're evaluating the app that you did every day. And so you have to do it in order to be able to answer those questions. But we're not looking at if you did it once or twice or by yourself or with a group. I hope that answers that question. Okay, uh, a couple more. Um, let's see, can we copy from Dave, David? Uh, can we copy and paste the question into a different platform such as Canvas, or other learning management system? Um, you can certainly do whatever you want to with our materials. As I said before, everything is totally free. Uh, if you're going to take the entire thing, uh, the only thing I'll say is uh, give credit to us. But if you want to just snag a question or two, that's fine. The only concern that we would have is you cannot use it for any commercial reuse. So for instance, you can't sell it on a teacher site, you know, some of these teacher sites where you get 
some kind of kickback for posting an activity um, because you know it's it's not really yours but certainly you can use anything and modify anything that we have and be aware that everything we're showing you right now are draft documents so nothing's in the final form yet <laughs> perfect um let's see is there a way for our workshop cohort to stay in touch after the week maybe a listener where we can all share ideas and this was from steve uh, great comment, Steve. You're, you're setting me up for tomorrow. Uh, we actually have a user forum. And one of the uh, things we're going to ask you tomorrow on your evaluation forum is, would you like to join it? And if you say yes, we, I will send you an invitation. You just have to accept that. And that user forum uh, has probably about 30 or 40 people on it right now. And the people who are on that forum are the past participants of our focus groups. Uh, that have that came to Tucson or um, <clears throat> that we we got input from as special consultants. So that would be a great way to stay together. Right now, we don't have any social media groups or anything like that. But for right now, during construction, that's a really good way to keep also informed of when we have something new for you to look at. Okay, and uh, Nicole picked up on a possible hiccup in one of the pre-test, pre-test, post-test. So she says, okay. the answer choices in the posted pre-test, post-test for the question are different from the Google form we did yesterday. The last choice was 50 yesterday, and on the posted document, the last choice is 90. So um, maybe a, a thought as to which might be correct? Yeah, let me, let me tell you what happened there, Nicole. Um, I actually changed the 90 to 50 for all of you yesterday. The reason is, is a, a lot of you probably know that right now, the size of our observable universe is estimated to be about 92 billion light years in diameter. Um, and we know that when we get Rubin data, we're going to have data that supports that. But for right now, the proxy data we're using, the very small set of data we're using, if you noticed in the app yesterday, only goes out to about 26 billion light years. So if you double that radius, you get a little bit over 50. So 90 wouldn't have worked, 40 was a little low. So I just changed the 90 to 50 for your purposes. And uh, a lot of times you'll notice that the wording that we have in our documents seems a little awkward for the data that we have. And that's because we're writing for data we don't have yet. <laughs> and in some cases, what we've done is we've gone back and modified the test uh, the text so it's not terribly confusing for user testing. In other cases, we haven't modified it and we've just left it go because we know that when we get our own data in there, uh, this is going to work flawlessly. Uh, so that, that was the, the reason for that. I'm surprised that you noticed that, but good, good catch. All right, I think we probably need to move on at this point. And uh, is Meg online with us? No. So you okay. might, while we do the polling for today, yep. you might want to give her an email. So I'm going to pull up a poll today and uh, launch it right now. And you should have some options about whether you've seen Comet Neowise. I can tell you it's been hard to see here in the Midwest, maybe hazy nights or it's so low on the horizon at sunset, it's been hard to see, but lately, but I was able to share it with my grandchildren last night, which was really a lot of fun. Oh, and I see Meg is now here. Oh, perfect timing. I won't send yes. the message. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Okay. Ask so and it shall come. So I will stop the, the, uh, polling here in 15 seconds. We've got a lot of different answers. And um, going to end right here and show you the results. So Artis, would you like to speak to any of this? This is, they got yeah. some interesting results here. Okay. Some yes, some no. Um, you might want to just give them, do you want to give them any information about the comet itself or? Well, I know on the first day, uh, many of you were saying, hey, have you seen the comet? And I thought that this would be an excellent polling question for today since we're doing the solar system. And uh, 
I know that uh, a lot of people have been looking. Uh, I've been thwarted a lot of days here because of the clouds in Tucson at this time of year. But um, it's, it's great that about half of you have seen this comet. And many people, of course, have been taking beautiful photographs um, and posting them on the internet. Um, I believe this week the comet is the closest to Earth. So we've still got a shot at seeing it, but it is getting dimmer now. And so if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's in the northwest evening sky. And depending on your latitude, you may be able to go out and look for it on your first clear night. All right. Thank you very much. I'll stop the sharing of results and turn it back to. All right. Well, I, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today. And uh, Meg, if you're ready, you can share your screen uh, as I introduce you. Uh, Meg Schwab is a lecturer at Queens University Belfast. And she's also co-chair of our Legacy Survey of Space and Time Solar System Collaboration, which is a worldwide group of scientists who are interested in using our data to learn new things about the solar system. So Meg has done a lot of different things in solar system research, um, from how planets evolve to looking at um, the, a lot of the small objects in our solar system, which is what our investigation will focus on today. She's been involved in citizen science projects such as Planet 4, and she's also studied the Martian South Pole and seasonal changes in the distribution of, of Martian features. So I'm pleased to give you Meg, and I'm sure you all enjoy her presentation. Thanks very much. I'm just going to log out and log back in because it's telling me that my operating system says that I have to give permission to share a screen. So let me do that and I'll be back in one okay. second. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Problems of having to uh, up, uh, upgrade to a new operating system to make my laptop work. So give me one second. So it's telling me to quit. So I'm, I'm quitting, but I will be back momentarily. Okay, great. Thank you. The joys of technology, eh? Ah, yes. Well, shall we go to another poll question uh, that we didn't get to earlier this week? Sure, Thanks. why not? All right, All right. Let's, go, let's go to, uh, let's see. We didn't do day one. Uh, we, we didn't do day one. Do you want to do that or day two? Day one is well, how are you starting school? And day two is the, uh, we, we did, did the genie two. in the bottle. We did yeah, the genie in the bottle. Let's do day one. Let's we'll do, do day, day one. one. All right, here you go, folks. I'm, I'm, cause I'm curious about this too. Um, how are you starting school next semester? <laughs> There's a lot of unknowns out there. And it looks like Maggie has gotten back in. I've admitted her. I will make her co-host. Perfect. And now it looks like, all right, that looks better. The joys of having to <laughs> update. Yeah, yeah. Update. OK, so I'm, I'm going to end, end so polling. Can all see this, right? That's right? Yes, we can see that very all well. All right, perfect. All right. 8% in person, wow. Yeah, not yeah, not very many people are gonna be going back to school in person, so. That's good. Interesting results here. A lot of you don't know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the future, so. Um, my sympathy is to all of you who are supposed to be taking care of classrooms. Yeah. All right, I will turn it back to you, Artis and Meg. Okay, Meg, take okay. it away. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And now that you can hopefully see my slides, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the co-chair of the LSST Solar System Science Collaboration. So that means part of my job is as community service to help engage the planetary astronomy community in getting ready for this fantastic telescope and survey that's gonna be coming online hopefully in about 2023. Um, and so I'm sure you've heard a lot about the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, but probably not a lot about in terms of what it's going to do for solar system astronomy. So I want to take one step back and ask, why do you study solar system bodies in general? Um, and the reason we do this is really because um, 
this tells us about how the solar system forms. Um, small bodies in planetesimals are the building blocks that formed our planets and they're the remnants left over. And so my analogy is that the orbits of these objects and their properties are like the broken glass and fingerprints after, um, you know, left over at a crime scene. It's how we piece together how the solar system formed and evolved. And it's these bodies that are telling us a lot about how the giant planets have moved around, how do we form planets, and even now that we're able to do comparative planetology even with small planetesimals with having planetesimals from other solar systems pass through ours. And so it's really important to study the small bodies of the solar system to really be able to understand our his solar system's history. And then we know of about four, over 4,000 extrasolar planetary systems. The best one we're ever gonna be able to study is our own. And so it's really important to be able to study these small body populations. Um, I love showing this slide because, um, you know, when we talk about finding moving objects, we rarely show actually how we do this. Um, and it really is, as my mom has said, when I asked when she asked what I do, it's find the moving blob in the image. And so if I can point this out, right, let's see if this is gonna work on my iPad, I think it will. That this object here that you're seeing, this is actually Eris. This is the uh, most massive dwarf planet in the outer solar system, right? And you can see it's moving between these three images. And so we're really looking for the object to move, right? And stars here are staying stationary. So again, planets being the wanderers, again, how they got their names that again, right? We're looking for solar system objects by looking at the, how they move. And a lot of times we use the parallax effect where we're letting these objects um, again um, by watching them move um, you know, based on the Earth's motion, um, boosting them along. And even in this image, you might notice this blip here that appears and disappears. That's actually an asteroid. So between these images that are taken um, about an hour and a half apart, the asteroid moves so fast it's out of the frame, but the more distant objects in the outer solar system are moving slower. And so again, just by looking at what things have changed in the image and how fast they're moving, we can figure out where they are in the solar system and then study both their sizes, um, sometimes their compositions, whether they're their commentary, whether they are fuzzy in essence, if they have a coma, how and um, their orbits. And so all of these properties can tell us a lot about how the solar system formed and evolved. Um, so I just wanted to give you a brief tour um, of the solar system and show this is all the known asteroids. Um, so the, the, the orbits here for the, the terrestrial planets um, getting all the way out to Jupiter's orbit and every other dot colored dot on this is an asteroid or a near-Earth object that we know of that's been discovered um, and cataloged. Um, so there's a lot um, that we know of, and this is looking out in the outer solar system more of the region that I study. So again, the, the circles here, the science circles are showing you the orbits of the, the giant planets. Um, and then every dot on there is a centaur or a Kuiper belt object or a comet. And again, uh, you know, Pluto is in this ensemble of objects beyond Neptune in what we call the Kuiper Belt. And we know about 4,000 objects like Pluto in the outer solar system. So again, I always joke when people say, what about Pluto? I'm like, it went home to the rest of the family, just like Ceres went home to the rest of the asteroid belt, right? Just because it's not a planet doesn't make it not interesting. Um, and that knowing 4,000 objects, we've learned a lot about the outer solar system and having, you know, large number of asteroids, we've really been able to do things. And so I just want to highlight that by showing you the structure of the Kuiper Belt. Um, and so in this plot, I'm plotting the semi-major axis versus eccentricity, so how elliptical the orbits are. And again, here's Pluto on, a, I'm sorry, not Pluto, Neptune on a very circular orbit. And everything afterwards has in some way sculpted by Neptune. And so you see these fingers that sort of stand up in eccentricity. These are mean motion resonances. So these are objects that are locked in a dance with Neptune that causes them to orbit in integral periods to Neptune. So these are the Plutinos, including Pluto, they orbit twice every time Neptune goes three times, and the two to one mean motion resonance, they orbit once every time Neptune does. And this protects them from, although these objects cross Neptune's orbit, they're always on the other side of the solar system when Neptune's nearby, so they don't get scattered. But you see there's a large number of objects that have semi-major axes and large eccentricities, and these objects have actually been scattered and gravitationally interacted with Neptune, and that's caused their orbits to change um, and elongate. Um, and so, this entire region has had some structure from interacting with Neptune. There's also a cold classical belt we call here, which is very low inclination, very circular orbits. And we think these objects formed in place and that everything else that has higher eccentricities was actually in place during Neptune migration. And just to show you this in a different way, where this is the major axis versus inclination. 
So again, how inclined the orbit is to the basically effectively the plane of the Earth's orbit. Again, you see that there's sort of a clump of objects that we call these co-classicals and everything else that seem to have pumped up inclinations or higher inclinations. And again, we think that all those objects were emplaced by giant planet migration. And so the story that we've learned from studying the small bodies has been that the giant planets didn't form where they are now. They've actually moved. So Jupiter's moved inward. And by scattering planetesimals, Jupiter moved inward. And Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune moved outward, depositing objects into the Kuiper belt, um, leaving that cold population that was probably primordial. And then the rest of the object that had actually formed more inward, including Pluto and the large dwarf planets in the outer solar system and putting them out um, where the Kuiper belt is today. And that this process is what formed um, the Oort cloud, um, where is a source of our long period comets. And so comet any otherwise is probably from one of these populations, whether it's from the Kuiper belt or from, from the Oort cloud, um, which is exciting. And again, so by studying even these new uh, pop or new objects or ones that are coming more inward, we have connections to things that are further out. So the Rubin Observatory is really going to transform um, what we do for small body science. Um, it's going to be 5 million small bodies, 1 billion observations effectively. Um, and so just to give you a scale, um, why I'm really excited about it is that, you know, we know of 20,000 uh, currently near Earth objects. Um, we're going to discover 200,000 with uh, LSST. Um, we're going to discover 5 million asteroids. And for me, you know, we know about 3,000, 4,000 hyperbolic objects. We're going to learn about 40,000. Um, and I've been struggling to even figure out how do you plot 40,000 orbits and what things you can learn from that. What we've already learned from 3,000 is a lot about Neptune's migration, what happens when you have 40,000. And we're going to discover, you know, about 10,000 um, comets. Um, and even a few interstellar objects like Oumuamua and Comet Borisov. So I just want to highlight that LSST is providing us with these moving object detections. So there's actually this pipeline that's going to be running um, and actually looking at those images to see when things have changed and sort of link those little fuzzy blo dot blobs as they move across the sky um, and provide us uh, astronomers the, the positions and the orbits of these objects and their brightnesses in each of the five bands that LSST will be observing in. And so it's really important for finding near Earth objects. We're gonna be able to look at some of these populations. I'm just showing again, just some estimates of, of um, for given brightnesses of these objects. But the idea being is that we're gonna, you know, be able to find lots of near Earth objects um, that potentially could hit Earth and others that won't be able to study this population that comes close by. We're gonna find five million maybe asteroids. Um, and just again, this is, versus absolute magnitude. So if I took the object and moved it to one AU, uh, AU, what would its brightness be? But the idea is that again, over a size range of, of different sizes, we're going to get, you know, thousands of objects and, you know, over 5 million in total. Um, and so again, we're going to be able to do precise astrometry, get good orbits, look for families, occlusional families, all these kind of things that we've done in small scale, but now by having so many more objects, um, we're really going to be able to dive into. Um, some of the exciting things that the LSST will do is there's objects called main belt comets and active asteroids. So these are asteroids that start to go bump in the night. They start um, outgassing, um, at least in terms of dust, and we think that means that there's some kind of volatile driving it, maybe water ice. Um, and others that seem to be have collided with an object and produced dust hails. Um, and so um, and even some that have probably spun up rapidly and now are breaking apart, and that's why you're seeing dust. And so there's a hint that objects that are really main belt comets where we think it's buried water ice that is being sublimated and causing what looks like cometary activity has some correlation with their orbital angle in Jupiter. Um, and so there's only about 12 to 15 known main belt comets, but LSST is gonna find an order of magnitude more of these and things like this object here that looks like it was a collision. You sort of see this X feature. And so it, the thought is that there's some object that can be and hit it. Um, and produce the uh, causing the the dust tail to be produced. So again, by having these large number of objects and having so many object uh, observations with LSST monitoring the sky nightly um, for solar system objects, we'll be able to know when these objects go off. We first start to see cometary activity and slew our telescopes and see how this evolves and pick out which ones are we think due to water ice and do we see this correlation with Jupiter's orbit. Or are they things that might be collisions and learn more about what's going on in collisions in the main belt asteroid? And this is interesting because this might be a potential source for water on Earth. If there's buried water, a significant amount of water ice buried 
stored in, in asteroids in the main belt. Maybe this is another way that water was deposited on Earth or something like some objects like this. Um, also, Trojans, which are in a one-to-one -one mean motion resonance with Neptune. Um, the, the, there's also Jupiter Trojans, and most of the giant planets have them. We're in a conundrum right now where when we study them, there's not a large number of them, but we find that they're mostly sort of have these, these G minus R, so G band versus R band optical colors that tend to be down here, very neutral, and then we know of one that's very red. And we don't 100% know why, and it seems to be very high inclination. And so maybe it has something to do with collisions, and so it's high up, and so maybe it doesn't collide with the disk very often of, of debris. We don't know. And so the room observatory is going to find us, you know, at least to order magnitude more objects. And so we're really excited as a community to learn what is just a color distribution of these objects. Are they mostly neutral or are there very high inclination red objects? And does that tell us something about their formation or maybe about the story about Neptune's migration? Um, the other thing that I think will be answered is what about planet nine? Um, you know, there's been discussion a lot about there being a distant planet beyond 200 AU. Um, although the main moving object pipeline won't be able to do this, it only finds motion within a single night, people in the community will be writing pipelines to extend that um, and mine the room observatory data to look for motion further than that to potentially find um, or confirm or deny whether there's a, a giant planet beyond Neptune that is controlling sort of the, the orientation of orbits of very, very distant objects. And I think there's still debate in the community of whether we're really seeing this orbital alignment of these very distant objects, which would mean that they're all seem to be clustered in one direction on the sky where they come to their closest approach. And the only thing that could do that in the known architecture of the solar system would be an additional planet on a centric orbit. Um, but there's a lot of contention about how you include all biases from different surveys as you combine them on the sky right now. Um, and one large survey that is uniform and well-known detection efficiencies is going to help answer this question. So it's one of the things I'm personally excited about is that room and observatory will play a role in this. And also, you know, we've talked about uh, comets in terms of NEO-wise, but, you know, we just recently had last year Comet Borisov come by, um, um, you know, from the interstellar space. And so these are planetesimals that were formed around other stars that are streaming through our solar system that we can study in the same way we reach out and touch the planet tessels in our own solar system and compare them and see how they're similar or different and really try to understand the extremes of planet formation on these really small scales. Um, and so again, these objects come by fairly quickly. So Oumuamua had about two weeks that the community could observe it on telescopes around the world. Borisov had a couple months um, where that was doable and went from north to south. So there's a point where northern telescopes could reach it then southern telescopes. But again, studying all the properties between how fast these objects are rotating, how big they are, what are their surface compositions, whether they're outgassing, um, whether they exhibit cometary behavior, can all tell us things about how, where, and where these objects formed in their own parent solar systems, and how does that compare to the story we know about our solar system? Um, and again, just between these two interstellar objects, um, Oumuamua is very point-like, so you can probably see here, it looks pretty much like a star, there's nothing around it. Um, you look at Borisov, and these are stars, but they're very, they're streaked because we're tracking at the rate of the object. But there's this fuzzy tail, right? It, it is a comet. It's it's directly outgassing significantly. And so already, the two interstellar objects are are like cats, right? They're very different in their behavior. Um, and so having you know, we're, we expect that Rubin Observatory will detect a few a year. So just finding this these new you know objects every year is going to really um, open up with the, the start of urban observatory operations. And I think again, really explore whether what we know about our own solar system, how well does that apply to other planetary systems? Um, and I just want to highlight we talk a lot about um, you know at least I do about asteroids and um, Kuiperbot objects, but comet comets is also something that. Um, Rubin Observatory will do a lot of. It's gonna monitor the sky for 10 years. It's going to find lots of objects that are coming just close enough in for us to be able to see them that are starting to outgas from the, both the Oort cloud and objects leaking, leaking in from the, the Kuiper belts. Um, and one of the exciting things is that there's synergies with you know, space-based missions. So I'm part of the Common Interceptor team and Common Interceptor is an ESA mission that is designed to go fly by a comet um, and its target isn't known. So the idea is it's going to launch in 2028. It's going to sit at the Earth, Earth Sun L2 point 
waiting for reachable comet. Um, and hopefully we'll know about the target ahead of time, but the best candidate survey to find a new comet coming into the solar system or potentially an interstellar object is the Rubin Observatory. And so the, we're preparing as a team as well as the community to expect that Rubin Observatory is going to be the telescope that finds the target that likely common interceptor will go to. So it's a really exciting mission in that it's the first mission that doesn't have a designated target right when it's being designed. It has, you know, it has a general idea and they're making conditions for it, but we don't know the name of the object or its orbit that it's going to be going to. Um, and that Rubin Observatory is, is being marked as the most likely candidate survey to find its, its candidate. And I just want to highlight, you're seeing all these tools about visualizations. We as a co community of scientists are also trying to learn and do this. And so I just wanted to point out some things that I did a month ago um, was that we just got our first simulated planetary database from the Rubin Observatory. So this is a simulated database of, of detections from a run of their simulator with the moving object detection pipeline run with it. Um, and so they took their sky survey, they populated what we know about the populations of the outer solar system and our solar system, and then gave us the da database that it would look like if we had been a year in on the survey. And so this is how, you know, figuring how to plot 40,000 points in orbit is not is challenging. It's not something I've done before. And so this is one of the things that I was learning is how do you plot when you have that many data points? And this is actually 40,000 Kuiper belt objects. Um, this is showing some major axis versus inclination. So again, that sort of plot I had showed earlier, but each one of these points is a simulated uh, Rubin Observatory detection. Um, and so there's just so many objects that I think you saw that plot before, but just how filled it is. Um, and again, just showing you that in, in some major axis versus eccentricity, right? Um, it just zooms so far out because of so many detections and how far they go out. But same thing, um, we as a community are still learning how do you visualize and then how do you pull that information out when you have so many objects? Um, so this is just a different way of viewing that in terms of some major axis versus inclination, sort of bidding in a histogram. And again, you can start seeing those um, resonant fingers sort of popping out again in inclination. Um, as well as other structure that we know is within the Kuiper belt, but it is much harder to see in a simple plot. Um, and so again, by having so many objects, we're going to be able to start revealing this. And so as a community, we're still learning how do we display and dive through this amazing and huge data set that's unprecedented compared to what we've been using for decades before. So I really just want to end with that and say, you know, really um, every solar system population um, is going to have large numbers of increases in the number of objects, um, light curves, we're going to figure about rotation of these objects and how they're rotating, how fast they're rotating, a little bit about composition from the multiple filters that we're going to be observing. And so it's really going to be an exciting time and that now the community is preparing for um, getting ready for first light and there's going to be lots more to come when, once the observatory is operational. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Schwamm. We have we do have a number of questions in the chat box, and so I'll start sharing them with you. Um, Great. First, first from Ken. Uh, actually, no, from from Mark. Uh, what is the magnitude of the most Kuiper Belt objects? Uh, it varies. So the brightest is 14th, which is Pluto. Um, the objects that can be detected with about a one to two meter is about 20, 20th magnitude, 21st. Eight meters can see about 25th magnitude. Um, so that's about Rubin Observatory, I think gets a 24.5 magnitude in our band. So it, we're getting pretty faint. Again, 200, uh, 200 kilometers, about the size of these objects at about 40, 50 AU. Okay, so from Mark, there are a couple of additional questions. And this was from earlier in your talk. It said, he asked, does the graph show that there is another undiscovered planet? And can LSST discover bodies in the Oort cloud? So we can't see to the Oort cloud directly. Um, it's too far away. So even the most distant Kuiper Belt object. So a, a planet at about 200 AU is about 20, could be, you know, is about two, 23rd magnitude. So. Um, getting out to about 20,000 AU is just not feasible with um, an eight meter telescope. But we can infer a lot about the Oort cloud from the things that are coming inward, right? So the known long period comets, we know that the Oort cloud is a spherical shell. That's what we're getting. And that we know for short period comets, actually, they come from a disk, which is actually the Kuiper Belt. Because one of the reasons why people started looking in the 90s for the Kuiper Belt out by Pluto, because we knew there had to be some disk-like structure providing the inclinations for the short theory comments. Um, 
in terms of thinking about um, Planet Nine, yeah, there's this debate about, we notice that all these very distant objects that appear to be detached from uh, Neptune have this closest approach around the same spot in the sky. Um, and you'd expect from the giant planets that actually that this, this position would diffuse around and so that these all these orbits would actually be randomized. And we do see that everywhere else in the solar system except here. Um, and there's an argument about whether it's the fact that they're so far away and so it's hard to see them. And so are we just seeing this because it's a combination of survey effects like the other part of the sky where you might look where the opposite is where the galactic plane is, which is large star density. So you might not want it's hard to look there in ways that most astronomers do where you take an image, look at the next image and see what moved when the star backgrounds are so high, you actually have to subtract the images off each other and that can be sometimes challenging. So there's still a lot of factors I think in here to say whether or not we know there's a planet out there, but the likelihood is if the models are right in terms of the theory that's been proposed, River Observatory should see Planet Nine. And if it doesn't, it's going to at least be able to see this um, orientation, right? And that we're seeing all these distant objects aligned this way. And if it doesn't, um, and we know exactly where Ruben Observatory pointed, we can actually put models through and see if it matches that the simulated detections and our real detections, whether they align um, and match what you'd expect if there was a ninth planet, uh, ninth, um, you know, planetary mass beyond Neptune. Okay, um, we were impressed for time and we have to move on to the next piece, but I did capture the additional questions that are in the chat box and I'll share those with artists who will share them with you. Great. Okay, thank, okay, you. thank you very much. Well, I, I want to also um, add my thanks that to me, this is a personally fascinating talk. I, I have a soft spot in my heart for the solar system objects. And uh, so, so I really appreciate this. And thank you, Meg. And if you would like to stick around, uh, you're welcome. But if you need to leave, we certainly understand that as well. And I just for the group, I wanted to let uh, everyone know that uh, Meg did share her slides. So as we've been doing, I will post her presentation after we're done here today. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we are going to take a break in a few minutes, but I think to, in the interest of making the most efficient use of our time, I will do what we did yesterday. And I will give you some instructions about what you're going to do today in your groups. And then when you come back from break, you will automatically be assigned to a breakout room as we've been doing, and you can go ahead and get started. We're going to call you back a little earlier today. We have a few other things we're going to do near the end of our session. So as before, we'll give you a five minute warning and then a one minute warning. So you know when to wrap up. Um, today in your groups, if you have time after you go through our solar system investigation, uh, we'd like you to just talk for a few minutes about differentiation. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with that term, um, differentiation is something that a lot of secondary instructors have to do. Uh, they have to design each lesson for three levels of challenge within the same class period so that every student's ability and challenge level is matched. Uh, some schools require differentiated lesson plans every day. Others do not, but they expect it's done. And at the college level, it's probably something that you never have to deal with. But knowing that uh, our secondary audience is going to be a large chunk of our users, we have tried to design differentiation suggestions into each of our documents, as well as an overall differentiation plan. So uh, if you have time today, you can take a look at that. And just uh, as a reminder, when you go to the meeting page and you're getting ready to click on the web app, which is the investigation that you'll work through together, Right underneath it, it says direction for breakout rooms. And you can take a look at that as a reminder of some different discussion prompts that uh, you might want to talk about as a group if you get done early. So with that, I want to thank everybody. We're going to take a five minute break. I have 49 on my computer, so let's try to be back by 54. And as before, when you come back, uh, introduce yourselves and go ahead and get started with your, your new investigation. Thank you.